Reverend Heather Baggett, Year C, Advent 1, November 29th, 2015. I'd like to begin today by sharing the first part of a godly play story called The Cycle of the Church Year. Time, time, time. There are all kinds of time. There is a time to get up in the morning. There is a time to go to bed. There is a time to go to school and a time to come home. There is a time to work and there is a time to play. But what is time? Some people that say that time is in a line. But I wonder what that would look like. Ah, wait a minute. What is this? Time. Time is in a line. This is time in a line. Look at this. Here is the beginning. It is the newest part. It is just being born. It is brand new. Look, it is getting older. The part that was new is now getting old. I wonder how long time goes. Does it go forever? Could there ever be an ending? It ended. Look at the ending. The beginning that was so new at the beginning is now old. The ending is the new part now. We have a beginning that is like an ending and an ending that is like a beginning. Do you know what the church did? They tied the ending that was like a beginning and the beginning that was like an ending together so that we would always remember that for every ending, there is a beginning, and for every beginning, there is an ending. That is kind of like our gospel reading today. I thought about starting today's sermon with a loud shout of Happy New Year, but decided against it in favor of the story. However, it would have been appropriate since today is the beginning of the new church year. However, our gospel doesn't seem to really celebrate the new year like we're used to. Instead of talking about beginnings, instead of anticipating the birth of Christ, it talks about destruction, the end of the temple of Jerusalem, the end of the world. However, just as we tied the two ends of the string together, beginning that looks like end with ending that looks like beginning, this beginning hearkens to an ending as well. Advent is the time we prepare to come close to the story of Christ's first coming. Perhaps it is appropriate to talk about the signs of Christ's second coming at that same time. Chronologically, the gospel reading from this morning comes just before the plot to kill Jesus is to unfold. His life is about to end, and the lives of his disciples are about to be shaken and torn apart in ways they couldn't begin to imagine. It is the beginning of the end and the end of the beginning. As one theologian writes, Luke wrote with a deep and growing sense that Christian discipleship is a kind of living in between, aware of Jesus, waiting for Jesus, and coming to know this Jesus for whom we wait in the midst of an eventful, unpredictable, even tumultuous world, waiting to stand before him, yet not always knowing where he is. Luke looks at the signs in the sun and moon and stars and the earth in distress he looks at the roaring of the sea and the waves. He looks at the people fainting in fear and foreboding and does not see despair. He does not fall into the trap of losing faith or giving up. Instead, he sees them as signs of the coming of the Son of Man, as hopeful as the first leaves unfurling on branches in the spring. As we think about the fulfillment of hopes, I would like to turn to the Old Testament reading from Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet to the people of Israel after they had been exiled to Babylon. They had turned away from God and as punishment were taken captive. They had watched many of their brothers and sisters fall to the enemy sword. They had the one place they knew God to be without doubt, be torn to the ground and destroyed. They were left unmoored with no place to talk to God and no assurance of God's presence in the strange and foreign land. Jeremiah speaks to them in the midst of their despair. He proclaims that the days of the Lord are surely coming when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It would have seemed as impossible as having pigs fly or the sky turn green to those being beaten, starved, and killed that any promise could be fulfilled in the midst of that. 
One commentator writes that sometimes the promises of God seem to disappear, but that with faith and patience, we can look forward to their fulfillment. We are called to a theological imagination in which we rely on God's continuous presence and put ourselves in a position so that we might work together with God in the advent of a new reality. Advent is the season when we contemplate our own theological imagination, contemplate how hope can be found in the midst of despair, contemplate promises being fulfilled in the face of their seeming impossibility. One Lutheran pastor, Heidi Newmark, once wrote, probably the reason I love Advent so much is that it is a reflection of how I feel most of the time. I might not feel sorry during Lent when the liturgical calendar begs repentance. I might not feel victorious even though it is Easter morning. I might not feel full of the Spirit even though it is Pentecost and the liturgy spins out fiery gusts of ecstasy. But during Advent, I always feel in sync with the season. Advent unfailingly embraces and comprehends my reality. And what is that? I think of the Spanish word en halo or longing. Advent is when the church can no longer contain its unfulfilled desire and the cry of an halo bursts forth. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Jeremiah sees his city burning around him. The readers of the Gospel of Luke see the temple of Jerusalem destroyed. And yet, they cry out there in halo. They're longing for the fulfillment of the promises of God, whose words will never pass away. Can we look around our world and see hurricanes and droughts, see mass shootings and horrific bombings, see starving children and homeless refugees, see polluted oceans and dying ecosystems, and somehow not fall into despair? This is what Luke calls us to. He calls us not to be weighed down. He calls us to prepare ourselves, to take action, to stand with those around us and help those who cannot stand for themselves. Luke's discipleship is a discipleship that is painful. Luke's advent is one that stabs deep. We are called to care even when it means our hearts might get broken. We are called to give even when we fear that we might not have enough. We are called to work even when it seems like we have no energy left. But we are not left there. The days are surely coming, proclaims the prophet Jeremiah. Though there is slaughter and deprivation all around, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. The soul deep longing for the kingdom of God that drives our actions will finally be fulfilled. The hope we celebrate today is not a quiet hope. It is not a hope that sits and waits or hope that fades away. It is a hope that drives us day by day, a hope that inspires, a hope that creates a longing so deep we cannot help but take steps towards its fulfillment in any way that we can. Do not let your advent pass you by in a haze of shopping and parties, stress and busyness. Live your advent fully as you prepare yourself despite despair and worry for the joyful coming of the Lord of righteousness. Look in your heart and ask yourself, where is your soul deep longing? Where is your and halo? Then ask yourself as a community of believers, how can you help each other fulfill the hope of God's promises? We are not alone in our actions or in our longings. We are called to be Christians, but we are also called to be a community of Christians. It is only in that community that we can remind each other of God's promises when they seem to falter. It is only in that community that we give each other strength, comfort each other, and walk together in our longing. It is only in community that we live into the advent of Christ, both as a child and as the Lord of righteousness in the second coming. There's a poem that I love that I think embodies Jeremiah's hope and Luke's hope. It is called What is Hope by Ruben Alvarez. It is a presentiment that imagination is more real and reality less real than it looks. 
It is a hunch that the overwhelming brutality of facts that oppress and repress is not the last word. It is a suspicion that reality is more complex than realism wants us to believe, and that the frontiers of the possible are not determined by the limits of the actual, and that in a miraculous and unexpected way, life is preparing the creative events which will open the way to freedom and resurrection. The two, suffering and hope, cannot live apart from each other. Suffering without hope produces resentment and despair. Hope without suffering creates illusion, naivete, and drunkenness. Let us plant dates, even though those who plant them will never eat them. We must live by the love of what we will never see. This is the secret discipline. It is a refusal to let the creative act be dissolved in immediate sense experience and a stubborn commitment to the future of our grandchildren. Such disciplined love is what has given prophets, revolutionaries, and saints the courage to die for the future they envisaged. They make their own bodies the seed of their highest hope. What seed are you planting with your body? What longing shows forth in your actions? What advent is the discipline of your love creating? Do not let them be unthought of or unconscious. Plant your seeds, act, and love with purpose, with longing and with hope this advent, so that the world of your creation is closer to the reality of God's kingdom, not further away. Let this advent be a season of disciplined and halo, disciplined longing. Come to Christmas, approach Christ, as Jeremiah would have, as Luke did, disciples of the in-between, in between darkness and light, in between captivity and promise, in between the now and the not yet, in between this world and the next, in between the beginning and the end, in between despair and hope, acting in full faith, even when God's promises seem to disappear into the shadows. This is how we Advent as a church. <laughs>